You are listening to Riverhouse Church's Sermon of the Week. We hope this talk equips and inspires you. Well, good evening, everybody. You look lovely. If, uh, if you th- if I've had people asking me uh, if I'm okay, uh, I know I look bad. Uh, I'm jet lagged, so I'll just answer that question. <laughs> That's... That's why my eyes have bags underneath them. So uh, it is good to be home. Thank you for praying for me and the team. Uh, We had a good trip uh, back from uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, We're going to share testimonies uh, next week, so you can stay tuned for that. Uh, God moved, and we are thankful for all the the prayer and support. Um, So yeah, good to be here, though. Uh, I traveled. I got back late Friday, so I'm still uh, I'm still recovering. Uh, but in my weakness, God's going to be strong tonight. So, uh, one other thing is uh, I heard a lot of feedback from last Sunday. Uh, we had the team from Bethel here, and uh, a lot of really good feedback. Um, also had some feedback that people were disturbed, and so I just wanted to address that and say, hey, that's totally fine. Um, you know, the goal here, uh, what we're trying to create at Riverhouse is that we be a discerning church, uh, not a doctrinated church, meaning uh, that, that you have really a responsibility to discern every sermon that's preached from this pulpit, uh, whether it be a guest speaker, uh, whether it be myself, whether it be anybody on staff. Um, you know, that's a responsibility that we all have, and there are times when God resonates things deeply with our spirit. There are times when things disturb our spirit, and I think we have to learn how to, to process and discern and weigh the difference and figure out why that is. And so really just wanted to address that to say, hey, uh, there are times that uh, I'll invite speakers intentionally, uh, not, not that I uh, completely disagree with their message, but that I won't necessarily agree with every aspect um, of their theology or where they come from because... Uh, we have a, a culture that we're creating here, but God is moving in a lot of other cultures too. Amen? Uh, and so if we're to be a discerning, mature community, uh, we have to learn how to discern and weigh and extract the precious from the worst, worthless and actually figure out who God is and who Jesus is and what love looks like. And that means we're a mature body. Amen? So if you have uh, any disturbances, like, please have conversations. Um, you can have conversations with me, with the staff, um, and, and really even amongst yourselves, is if there's times where there's, like, process, and let those be times of healthy dialogue where we're learning to grow into the likeness of Jesus. Amen? So there doesn't need to be fear around disturbance. We can embrace it and have honest, brave communication around it. So I haven't even heard what happened Sunday, but that's just kind of my general philosophy, and I just wanted to remind you all of that, that we are learning and growing, and we want to hear different perspectives, different cultures, different churches, different nations, different people who see have a different aspect of Jesus than we do. Amen? So that's all I have with that. I'm going to pray, then jump into the message for tonight. So Lord, I thank you uh, that when you speak, God, those words contain your heart and that you actually impart your nature into us and transform us into the image of Jesus. And I pray, God, that tonight there'll be transformative power through your love that's communicated, God, that actually uh, accomplishes a good work tonight in your church. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, So I'm going to talk about love tonight. And uh, I've, I've been on a journey the last uh, five months uh, in particular where the Lord has uh, just brought me into some thresholds that have been really uncomfortable for me and a lot of disturbance within me and, and a lot of uh, even fear. There's been a terrifying aspect of this uh, kind of wildness within the heart of God that I have been journeying and navigating and trying to find language to articulate the path that I'm on and have been seeking God very fervently uh, in these last months, uh, trying to discern what's taking place, what is it that's happening, and trying to just put language to things. And uh, so I'm just going to kind of set up uh, where I've been, the journey that I've been on, and then, and then hopefully articulate some words tonight that will give context for your own journey and, and bring you into a very tender place within the heart of Jesus. And so uh, when I look back at probably the last uh, you know, years of my life, there's been a very consistent theme uh, of a prayer that I've been asking God that you'd possess me with love. And uh, this has been something that's been very, um, like a wanting within me, this desire of knowing there was something more. And I've shared this here, uh, I believe that 
Uh, it was in the first year of the church, I preached a message on love. Uh, I think it's called A Call to Love, and it's by far uh, the, the biggest, the most hits we've ever had on a podcast by like a long ways. Uh, and, and I know it struck a chord with the church, and it was really me. It was an emotional sermon, uh, more just articulating my desire uh, to be uh, living from this, this, this selfless love of agape and something that I had touched but hadn't necessarily feel like had completely yielded to, and uh, this has really been a journey that I've been on um, for for years, and uh, in the last uh, five months, there's been really significant strides that have taken place within me uh, that I feel um, equipped to bring you into tonight, and felt like God said it's it's, it's time to to talk about this, so that's what I'm going to talk about tonight, and just want to talk about uh, agape love and uh, the nature of love and what I'm learning about love, and I really hope that uh, you're as disturbed as I am when you walk out uh, the door tonight, because love is a fierce and tender and awesome thing, and I think that my perspective, I've had just a revelation um, that's really shifting and wrecking me in a very profound sense um, within me. And uh, I, 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 I've started to define uh, these different processes that the Lord's had me in, particularly in the nature of love. And I would say um, that there's two, I think there's two distinguishable works uh, pertaining to love um, that I'm becoming aware of in my life. And the first was that um, you, we, we all have to go on a journey of becoming the beloved. And I believe that this is the beginning of our journey with God. Uh, to become the beloved of Jesus uh, requires humility uh, and, and it will require that we start, you know, we come to him and he, and he starts pursuing us in the midst of our pain and our brokenness and the things that we did because we didn't know who we were and the, the reality that we prostituted ourselves with other gods and other things and that uh, we, we made these decisions and we did these things and we're all sinners and we have to look at ourselves and we have to face our shame. But in the midst of that, we become the beloved as this sin thrashing storm of God's mercy overtakes our life it breaks us down and then builds us up and as we become the beloved we find our identity we discover who we are that we belong to him and that he loves us with a fierce unconditional love that won't change it's unrelenting and we we start discovering who we are and who we are not and we begin to build boundaries in our life and we learn I believe that this is the entrance into the heart of God it's the entrance into the presence of God it's the entrance into a life of prayer it's the entrance into a life of intimacy we become the beloved. This is not a quick work. This is a long work. I can see, you know, years, seven, seven, eight years of my life was just dedicated to the Lord shaping and forming my identity. I was becoming the beloved. I was learning to receive the love of God. There was a deep work, a deep healing in my soul. It was about me and God. It was beautiful. It's necessary. It was foundational. And I think everybody goes on the journey of becoming the beloved. Amen? All right. and, and now what I'm beginning to recognize is that this uh, was, is beautiful, it's necessary, it's essential, it's foundational, and yet I've, I've found myself over the last year slowly crossing this threshold that, that was awakened really first just by a desire, that I knew that there's something more. I, I knew that there was a, a, a greater place of expression, of becoming this selfless agape love, right? And, and what is agape love, right? Agape is patience. This is 1 Corinthians 13. Agape is kind and not jealous. Agape doesn't brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. It doesn't take account a wrong suffered. It doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Right? It's this self-giving, selfless force of to be reckoned with right it, it's it's completely selfless and and I, over the last probably 7 years I, I have memories and times where i came into a conscious awareness of this selfless force overtaking me and coming over me and it was very powerful but also very convicting because i i i would recognize that 
that wasn't my daily reality. Does that make sense? So it was like I started becoming aware that there was this consciousness of love. There was this, this force of love that I knew existed, but that I didn't, I didn't embody. I didn't abide. Right? And, 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 I've, and I'm starting to put language that, that becoming the beloved is the foundation for the next work that rests upon this work, which is becoming love. Right? So God wants us to become the beloved. He disciples us into becoming the beloved. But then as we become the beloved, there's a shift, there's a threshold that has to be crossed where God starts actually discipling us into becoming love itself. Right? And I've been really challenging and been being corrected by God in the season where I'm recognizing that in my past, I saw my destiny as what I was put on this earth to do. And what I mean is that when I received a prophetic word or a promise from God, I was just overjoyed with the implications of what God was telling me I was going to do. And because I saw my destiny as the expression of what I was going to do on the earth, I then realized that to do those things, I needed to become like Jesus to be able to do those things. Does that make sense? But I saw my, my character development. I saw who I was becoming as a servant of what I was called to do because what I was called to do is my destiny. And God has been shifting and changing, even changing my affections, where I'm starting to recognize that my destiny has nothing, has very little to do with what I'm called to do. My destiny on this earth is about who I'm called to become, who I was created to be, meaning this. My, the, the prophetic words, the promises, the things I'm called to do are simply the unique set of circumstances that God has designed to disciple me into agape love. Right, so my destiny is actually to become love. And the promises and the things he's called me to do have a cross in the midst of them that are designed to transform and shape me into love. My destiny is to become love. Right, and part of this reshaping, the changing of my affections, has come from the disturbance of I've started to express and embody the things that I was prophesied I was going to do. I've done them in measure, and they don't satisfy they don't satisfy. They don't meet this deep thing in me that's craving for substance, that's craving for something real, that's thirsting and hungering for something more than what earth has to do. I've started to recognize that can't be my destiny because I'm, I'm hungering for something more. And I had the intuition to recognize, well, I could chase a bigger church and a bigger ministry and a bigger crusade and a bigger whatever, but that's just going to be bigger more problems, more difficulties, all these things. It's not going to satisfy. That is not what I'm yearning for. I'm yearning to become love. There's this selfless force called agape that, that is God that somehow by a miracle of grace I can actually become. And when I touch that place, something in me awakens that doesn't awaken anywhere else. My destiny is to become love. So God is discipling us into becoming the beloved. And I believe that this is, this is, this is the rest of our lives we're going to grow in this. But as this starts settling, as the concrete starts to get firm, as the foundation is laid, God then begins to build. He begins to, to cross us into a threshold of actually becoming love. And I've been in the the. the, the the navigating of this threshold, and I would say it's intensified greatly the last five months of my life, and I, it, it is a wild place in the heart of God that is highly, highly intimidating to me. And I am in the midst of, of navigating and walking into what feels like a black hole, and I don't know what's on the other side, but there's something compelling me to just abandon my life to this radical force of agape love. And I've been for five months in an intermittent encounter with the heart of God that has completely been wrecking me and completely exposing and revealing things in me I did not know. There's, there's places of self-protection and fear and all that, that, that stayed dormant when I was just becoming the beloved, but are now manifesting as I'm stepping into this threshold of actually pondering the implications of what it means to become selfless love as, as the, the way you live and move and have your being throughout the everyday ebbs and flows of normal, difficult life. Richard Foster, he's a contemplative. 
written a lot of books on prayer. He says this uh, in, in, in one of them. He says that today the heart of God is an open wound of love. He aches over our distance and preoccupation. He mourns that we do not draw near to him. He grieves that we've forgotten him. He weeps over our obsession with muchness and manyness. He longs for our presence. And what intimidates me as I've as I've been pondering, as I've been coming into contact with this force of love, is that is the awesomeness of covenant faithfulness. That God, with this tender, fierce affection, looks at us human beings, looks at this broken world, and says, I pledge to love you with a fierce, unrelenting affection every single moment of your life. I will not close my eyes. I will not shut my heart. I will not self-protect. I will not seek my own. I will not hide myself. I will not wallow in fear. I will not disconnect from you. I will look at you. I will see you. I will pursue you. I will unrelentingly love you every moment of your life, whether you spit on me or you embrace me, whether you crucify me or you curse me or you 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 whip me or you beat me or you praise me and you worship me, I will love you with an everlasting love. If it requires me to mourn, I will mourn, but I will love you. If it requires me to weep, I will weep. If it requires whatever it requires to let you go, I will let you go. If I have to distance myself, I'll distance, but I will love you with an unrelenting, unwavering, unconditional, selfless love because it's simply who I am. And so if I ponder the implications of my becoming like that. I know it means the death of me. I know it means that something has to go in me. This self-protection can't have it. The justifications of Distance of edging the, the edges that keep my distance and keep people away and this and guard my heart and protect and protect and protect them. All, all, they, that doesn't exist. So to become agape, I become possessed with this tender, fierce affection of God. And my ability to self-protect and turn it off is crucified. So I stand exposed with this vulnerable, tender heart that will become an open wound because it's a dying, painful planet. And I'm not called to love everyone, but there will be people I am called to love with the love of God. And I will not, by, by my choice, by my surrender, be able to justify self-protection. And that... It's terrifying. That is the abandonment of me. In my journey, the fundamental virtue that, that needed to be grown in me in becoming the beloved was humility. The humility to look at my shame. But I'm finding that the fundamental virtue needed in becoming love is courage. The courage to become like Jesus, the exposed one, the ever exposed one. Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. And take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. A 
deny himself, deny herself. I'm pondering these words. What does it look like to deny myself? Not just for a moment, not just for a day, but as a covenantal decision that I forfeit my rights. I forfeit my rights, my needs, me, 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 me. I was driving in the car to the airport on Thursday to fly home. And uh, one of the pastors I work with, his daughter was in the back seat with me. She's 12 years old. She said, Pastor Jordan, can I ask you a question? I said, of course. She said, what, what was your ambition when you were my age? I tried to explain professional golf and <laughs> cricket. <laughs> um, best I could. And then I said, what's your ambition? She said, I want to be a missionary. So where? She said, here. She said, there's so many people that don't know Jesus, I want to tell them. And then she looked at me and she said, and I want to be a martyr. I looked at her and I said, what? She said, I want to be a martyr for Christ. Smile on her face. I sat there silent. I said, yeah, you get this thing, don't you? We're all called to be martyrs. Living martyrs. Regardless of the way we die. Martyrs for Christ. Denial of ourselves. Not living for me. Living for him. One of the perspectives that I have and probably the burden I carry because of the ministry that I do amongst the poor, the really poor, is that I begin to recognize the me-centricness of American Christianity. It's like a gravitational force that just wants to pull us just a slight deviation away from a Christianity with a cross. It's supposed to be cross-centric, not me-centric. And we get so caught up, even in beautiful cultures, of all the blessing. That Christianity is a message about God's blessing. He's going to bless my business. He's going to bless this. He's going to bless my life. He's going to bless all this blessing and favor and good things. Like That's good, but that's not the message of Christianity. It's a message that I'm going to make you love. I've given you a cross to transform you into love, and that's your destiny. And all the other things are good, but they're just means of becoming. They're means of becoming love. I've had to go back, and the Lord's been taking me these last months back on my journey, and he's been showing me the little deviations of, of even how I interpreted my own story that were just little deviations away from the cross. And it's back to the cross, back to the cross, back to the cross, back to the cross. And he's told me emphatically, your story is a story of the cross. Your story, the center of it is the cross. The very center of your life, the axis upon which all you are revolves is the cross. That Jesus came and he died and he bled and on a cross and then has asked me to do the same. It's the very center of this faith, self-denial. It's not about what I get. It's not a bit what my life's like. It's not about if it's going good or going bad or what my financial situation is. God doesn't promise we're all going to be rich. God doesn't necessarily care. If we're rich or not, he cares if we're becoming love. He doesn't care about our influence. He doesn't care about the size of our platform. That, that, there's a secondary to him. He cares that we're becoming love. Because right? this is the thing. Jesus 
was a wounded heart. He was a man well acquainted with suffering and grief. He, he was an open wound of love, and it's through that open wound of love that the power and the kingdom flows. Jesus moved with compassion, healed. Moved with compassion, delivered. Moved with compassion, raised the dead. Moved with compassion, Jesus ministered. Compassion, if you look it up, it means this, an uncontrollable desire to alleviate the suffering of another human being. You know why he was moved with compassion? Because his heart was moved, was an open wound of love. It was agape. It was just this pure, pure self, selfless force of tender affection that weeps with those who weep, that mourns with those who mourn, that was so available to see and feel and know. We, he's a God who sees. He's a God who hears. He's a God who listens. It says that in Exodus, the slaves were bent. The Hebrews were bent. Their backs were bent under the yoke of Egyptian bondage. And it said God saw them and he heard his heart is an open wound of love. He's just love. All he thinks about is others. He doesn't think about himself. He's God. We think he's God. He's sitting there. He's just receiving all the worship. He, does, he doesn't think about him. He thinks about others because it's this agape. It's this force of self-giving love. And to actually abandon ourselves to that force means we have to die and our rights have to die and, and all the things and all the want. It just, it's just not, it's not significant anymore. It's love. I was on an airplane a couple months ago. I was sitting on the window seat, and the guy next to me was disturbed. He was almost to the point of tears. The flight attendant asked him, are you okay? And he said, uh, no, I, I just found out my cancer's come back, and I'm, I'm flying to Boise to meet with my doctor to see how bad it is. He was in fear, anxiety. And uh, I ended up praying with him later in the flight. But I sat there next to this man. And it was like love. Like love consumed me. I had to like look. I had to look away and just weep. And weep and weep. Because I, I felt the heart of God for this man. And it got so intense that I had to say Stop. Stop, I can't, just please stop, I can't take anymore. Self-protection had to kick in. I'm not ready. I can't, I can't yet. I went to Mozambique to sit under Heidi Baker's ministry because she scared me. So I listened to her messages, I read her books, I studied her life, and there was something that didn't equate. I knew that there was a force that compelled her that I was foreign to. I read Reese Howell, The Intercessor, years ago in college. Talks about when he got filled with the spirit, truly filled with the spirit of love, the Holy Spirit. The first thing that happened to him is he got so possessed with love for the town drunk, they couldn't do anything but follow him around for, for weeks. He was wrecked, completely consumed by the self-giving force of the affection of God. I was foreign to me. I'd had these moments, but over these last five months, it's been an intermittent and yet ongoing encounter with this, this, this weighty force of love, and it's been honestly terrifying me. I feel like I'm crossing this threshold of the wildness of God's heart, and my knees are trembling 
with every step because I'm abandoning myself to this black hole of unknowing. I don't know what's going to happen on the other side, but I know that there's a denial that has to take place in me and the rights, my right to self-protect. What I've recognized is that in my life, if somebody hurt me, what I did is fear ju used that pain to justify my wall of self-protection, my wall of self-protection. These little things, these rights, these needs, I have this. I have, it, it was just these places of me that stayed hidden. It was hidden when I was being the beloved. But in becoming love, it can no longer be, it can no longer stay, it can no longer, it's no longer appropriate, it's no longer, I'm maturing to a new place of love. This is our destiny. It's to become love. And I believe it is, it is more than within the room of possibility. It is the ordained will of God for our lives. Because when we become love, when we actually can become abandoned to this type of selfless, fierce, tender affection, we become ministers of reconciliation. We go to the world and say, here's love. Like, here's God. Here's what his love looks like. Right, we embody his love. We become his love. His love becomes incarnational in us. His word becomes flesh in us. You know, God has been communicating since the beginning of humanity. We see it in the Bible. He's spoken dreams. He's spoken vision. He spoke through angels. He spoke through prophetic oracle. He spoke through the, the law. He spoke through a donkey. He, sp he spoke through so many ways. But the pinnacle of his communicative brilliance was when the word became flesh. Nothing else was enough until God became a man. He said, let me show you. Let me show you. Through my pierced hands, let me show you what love looks like. And we're Christians, disciples of Jesus. I think America needs to stop being a Christian nation and we need to become a nation of disciples, of people that are discipled into the image of the great rabbi so that we can embody this great communicative brilliance of God and quit telling people that God loves them and just start loving them with that fierce tenderness of the heart of God that is a bleeding heart, that is a wounded heart, that is a, an open wound. Uh, to be a Christian, to be a disciple of Jesus is to be affected by the brokenness of the world. For some reason, we can live so unaffected in the United States of America, and yet I sit with a 12-year-old girl in her nation, and she sees. She sees to the point that she desires to give her life. I asked her father, and said, what do you think of this? He said, it's not out of fear, it's her joy. She's heard the stories, she's seen the stories of people that laid down their lives and it awakened something in her, it's her dream.
disturb us, God. Disturb us, God. Disturb us, God. Disturb us. That when you find us, you won't find a people with their rights, their offenses. their wounded egos, their complaining hearts, their disappointment. Over the blessings they thought they deserved but didn't get. Their frustration over circumstances that didn't line up according to how we thought they should. God, dead to self. May we be a people who deny ourselves. And live at the foot of the cross. Disciple us into love, God. We want to become love. In the agony and the ecstasy of all that entails, we want to become love. We want to have fellowship with your wounded heart and know both the joy and the sorrow of your great soul, Jesus. We want your love to become incarnational in our lives. We want to look like you. So disturb us. Out of our safety nets, out of our comfort zones, and out into the deep, oh God. Let the wind of your spirit blow us out into the deep, into the unknown waters, into the uncharted places of your heart, into the wildness of agape, into the awesomeness of covenantal faithfulness, that we too can stand before the ones you've called us to love. And say, I will love you relentlessly, fiercely, tenderly, no matter what you do, no matter what you say to me, no matter how you treat me, no matter if you reject me or you accept me, if you wound me or you bless me, I will love you. I will love you with the love of God. I will love you with the the fierce tender affection of Jesus and I will show you the heart of God. Disturb us, God, out of the mediocrity. Disturb us, God, out of the the egocentric deviations of our faith, God. Disturb us into the pure flow of agape love and may we abide there. All the days of our life, Jesus. Thanks for listening to the Riverhouse Podcast. For more information, visit riverhouseministries.com.